God speaks and he gives us his voice because he doesn't want us to be easily swayed by anything. He doesn't want us to be easily deceived by anything. God gives us his voice because he does not want us to be easily offended by anything. God gives us his voice because he doesn't want us to fall into confusion. He gives us his voice because he wants to direct our steps. He gives us our vo his voice because he wants to guide us, direct us. He wants to tell us in the direction that we ought to go. Why does God give us his voice? Well, God gives us his voice to remove all disorder in our lives. Whenever there is disorder, chaos, confusion, a disorder in your spiritual life, the voice of God comes to bring order where there is chaos and where there is disorder. Shout disorder. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 33 that God is not a God of disorder. And wherever you find disorder, you will find rebellion. Wherever any area in your life that is out of order, you're going to find some rebellion there. And so God gives us his voice to put things in alignment in our lives. To come and begin to put what was out of order into order. He comes with his voice in our lives for several reasons. He comes to speak to us, to remove us from all doubt and unbelief and to take us into faith. So the voice of God is very important. If we do not know how to discern the voice of God in the last days, many people, the Bible says, will be deceived. And so I don't want the church to fall into deception. You have to know the art of when God is speaking and when other voices are speaking. I said to you last week and the week before that there are many voices that are speaking. There are the voice of our conscience, the voice of our flesh, the voice of our selfish carnality, the voice of our own reason and logic, the voice of the enemy. There are a lot of voices that are constantly uh, speaking to us. But the voice of God is something that we can learn to hear. How many of you want to learn to hear the voice of God? Now, why do some people not hear God? Why, what happens to an individual that wants to hear God, but perhaps they're not able to hear God? Now, I'm going to tell you a lot of reasons why people do not hear God. One reason is because they have not asked God to perfect their hearing. You must ask God, as we just read in the scripture, to perfect our hearing. We must ask the Lord, give me ears to hear to what you're saying. Let me hear your word. Let me improve in my hearing. That is one reason why people do not hear. When was the last time you prayed, God, I want to hear your voice. It may not be an audible voice. It may not be necessarily an audible voice that you hear, but the voice of God can be discerned and can be perceived. Another reason why people do not hear God, number two, is because their minds are so cluttered. Because there's a lot of noise in their minds. In other words, the mind is a mess. In other words, the mind is out of order. In other words, the mind is so busy and so active that it has not quieted, it has so much noise. We have the noise of social media. We have the noise of the world. We have the noise of our own flesh. We have so much noise and so much clutter that we cannot perceive and hear the voice of God because God is speaking, shout God is speaking. So when our mind is cluttered, we have to know how to reduce the noise because one thing that the enemy wants in your life is to clutter your mind. The, one of the strategies of your enemy to defeat you is to clutter your mind. He wants to cloud your mind. He wants to cause your mind to be in a state of disorder. Why? Because if it's cluttered, it cannot hear God. Although God is speaking, you cannot discern it because there's so much noise. And another reason why people do not hear the voice of God is because they do not fill their mind with the scriptures. They do not fill the mind uh, with the word of God. Hear me. Most of the directions that God is going to give you will come when the Holy Spirit reminds you of a scripture. The majority of the way that God speaks is that the Holy Spirit will remind you of a scripture. But if you don't know scripture, 
then how is he going to remind you? And so many people cannot hear God because they do not take the time to memorize, to know the scriptures. So you have to saturate your mind with the word of God if you really want to perfect your hearing. And you have to watch how his voice begins to increase. Every time you saturate your mind with the word of God, you saturate your mind, you quiet your other voices, and you begin to saturate your mind with the word of God, you will always start to hear God clear. Watch how God's voice begins to increase. Now, many people get confused. There's a lot of people that think that it's God that's speaking to them, that it's God that's telling them certain things, that it's God directing the steps. Many people get confused. Many people think that it's the voice of God. And we say this, and I'm going to tell you something. It's not just peace. Because the Christian church has been accustomed to something. And we say things like, I feel peace. But peace is not the only filter that you should filter whatever direction you are hearing. Many people think that it's the voice of God when in fact it was not the voice of God. Sometimes it's the voice of ambition. Sometimes it's the voice of our soul. There are a lot of voices that are constantly talking to us. So unless you saturate your mind with the word of God, you'll be able to discern what God is saying. And another reason why people do not hear the voice of God is because there's disobedience. Disobedience will not permit you to hear the voice of God. It affects your communication with God. Every time there is disobedience in your heart, disobedience in your mind, disobedience. Did you know that fear is a sin? That's why fear does not allow you to hear from God. So whenever there is disobedience in your life, it cuts the communication between you and God. Our prayers do not reach God. And whenever we have disobedience in our lives, you can tell because disobedience always leads us to three things. Disobedience will lead you always, number one, to sadness, to frustration, and to religion. Whenever you are disobedient, it will always lead you to frustration, to sadness, and to religion. But whenever you are obedient to God, you can hear and perceive the voice of God, then there is no religiosity in you. There is no sadness because you can hear and perceive the voice of God. Disobedience will always put a veil over your eyes. Whenever you know, as James says, the good that you ought to do, but you do not do it, that is sin. And so whenever we know the good that we ought to do, but we do not do it, we are in sin. We are in disobedience. We are opposing what God is telling us. And that disobedience always takes us to cut the communication lines between us and God. Whenever there is disobedience in our lives, there's a veil we cannot see. We cannot hear. We cannot uh, perceive what God is saying. Let me say this to you. It's not that God is not speaking. And it's, it's not that God doesn't want to talk to you. Because I said to you in part one that it is your inheritance that God wants to speak to you. I don't know of a heavenly father. I've never known the heavenly father not to want to speak to his children. The heavenly father wants to speak to you. Because I know that many of us grew up in an atmosphere where dad was quiet and he was probably just a provider. But, and he didn't maybe, maybe talk to you much. But I came to tell you that the Father in heaven wants to talk to you. He wants to order your steps. He wants to give you instruction. He wants to affirm you. He wants to order your steps, help you, guide you. And he wants to give you the right direction. But whenever there is disobedience in our lives, it puts a plug in our ears. And we cannot hear what the Spirit of God is saying. So it's not that God is not speaking. It's that we're not listening. It's not that we're not, he's not speaking. It's that we're not paying attention. Ah, I'm going to say that again. Have you ever been um, in a place or in a conversation with somebody and the person was speaking, but you weren't paying attention? Right? 
Because they, it's not that they weren't talking. And it's not that they weren't speaking. It's that we weren't paying attention. And many times God is speaking, but we are not paying attention. And we are not obeying the steps of God. So it's not that God's not speaking. It's that we are in disobedience. Shout disobedience. Sometimes God does speak. But sometimes we choose to listen to an enemy. I need to give you this because I need to pause here before I give you the filters. Many times God is speaking. Many times God has already told us the answer. But a lot of times is that we chose to listen to an enemy instead. Look what, look what it says in Genesis chapter 3 and I'll prove my point. Verse 8. Here's Adam and Eve. And the Bible says, read it out loud with me. Let's read it together. And they heard. And they what? They heard what? The voice of the Lord. Uh-huh. So wait a minute. Read it slow. So Adam and Eve what? Heard. They hear the voice of the Lord, God, walking when or where? In the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, um, God, amongst the trees of the garden. So they got scared because of their disobedience. It wasn't that God wasn't speaking. They heard God. They heard his voice, but they chose to hide. Ah. Do you know how many people God is speaking to them, but they're hiding? Do you know that's why the scripture says when you hear the Lord calling you, do not harden your hearts. When you hearken the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. Many times the voice of God is there, but we're not listening because our hearts have become hardened. And so we have to analyze our lives. Have we become like Adam and Eve? Where now we've become disobedient. And we are no longer hearkening the voice of God. Where we are no longer listening to what God is telling us. It is possible for us to become so hardened in our heart. That it's not that God is not speaking. He's a good father. He's a loving father. He's a merciful father. He wants to bring his children back. He's like the father in the prodigal son story. He's waiting with open arms for his children. He wants to converse with you. He wants to have communication with you. He wants to embrace you. He wants to hug you. He wants to love on you. But many times our heart has become hardened. And we're hiding when he's calling us. So here in the story, when we read the book of Genesis, we find that they heard the voice of God, but they hid. Why did they hide? If we go back and reference the story, we find that, they, that after God gives them instruction, and God says, you can eat of any tree in the Garden of Eden, except one. Do not eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen? Somebody shout, I remember. I remember. But then the Bible says that the serpent showed up to the garden. And then the serpent began to also speak. And that voice of the enemy came in to confuse what God has already spoken. So many times our disobedience is clouding out the voice of God. And we're disobedient because it's not that God didn't speak. It's that we're choosing to listen to the devil. So Satan, he needs a confused mind so that he can destroy you. He cannot destroy you unless he confuses you. Ah. He cannot destroy you until he deceives you. He cannot destroy you until he twists what God says. The enemy knows exactly how to confuse people. Satan needs a lie to destroy you. Satan needs a and a lie to become the truth in your life to be able to deceive you. Satan needs you to believe the lie. Satan needs you to, perhaps you heard from God, you know the good you ought to do, but then you began to twist what God says. And Satan needs that to happen in order to destroy your life. Satan needs confusion. That's how the enemy works. He works in a threefold three way. In a three-chord way. He works in a way, number one, to draw you away from God. And how he does that is by bringing confusion. By bringing a, a lie. 
A lie is not powerful unless the lie is actually accepted. Every lie that the devil throws at you, it is not powerful. It is only powerful until you believe it. Every lie of the devil is not powerful until you believe it. And so he works in a threefold way. The enemy needs the lie to become true in your mind. And so he wants to separate you from the voice of God. Separate you from God. And how does he do that? He comes to confuse you. He comes to deceive you. He comes to twist and pervert what God just spoke. The second thing that the enemy does is he thwarts God's purposes in your life. He twists them. He perverts the purposes of God over your life. Where once perhaps you were walking in the purpose of God and you are no longer walking in the purpose of God. The enemy loves to twist. The enemy loves to pervert. The enemy is not a creator. He just takes what God said and then he tries to pervert it. He takes what God says and then he tries to twist it. He turns it around. And, and, and all of a sudden you find yourself no longer in your purpose. And the third fold that the enemy and how the enemy operates is through division. He's always looking to divide something. He's always, his, his strategy is always division. He, he, he is a divisive kind of enemy. He likes to put division in families, in marriages, in churches, through pastors, through leaders. He's looking for a place where he can put division. Because that is his way of, of attacking. So when you look at the enemy's strategies, you'll find that he's always looking to divide you and the voice of God. He's going to try to divide what God said, what God said he would do, what God wrote about you. He's going to try to divide that. He's going to try to divide what God said and who you are, your identity. He's going to try to twist it pervert it and he's going to try to divide you from the word of God Satan's strategy is always to defeat you the Bible says that Satan comes to steal help me steal kill and to destroy but how does he do it well Romans tells me how Romans chapter 8 verse 5 tells me how it says those that live in the flesh have their minds set on the flesh but those that live in the spirit have their minds according to the spirit. So the devil says, I know I can't go in and destroy them because they're children of God. So I'll let them destroy themselves. And how does he do that? Through your own mind. The devil says, all I need is their mind. If I can get them to believe what I say, they're already destroyed. He's already got you. And so here Romans says, those that live according to the flesh set their minds on things that are in the flesh. Those that live in the spirit have their minds set on the what? Spirit. In other words, what the devil's saying, what God is saying that the devil does is if he's going to defeat us, he's going to do it with our minds. And the way he does it is he's looking for you to operate in your flesh. Because those that have and walk by their flesh have their mind on what? The flesh. And those that walk by the spirit have their mind where? In the spirit. So if you have your mind on the flesh, okay, your mind is in the flesh, then guess, if you're living by the flesh, guess where your mind's going to be? In the flesh. What is the flesh? Shout, I have a flesh. Say, I have a flesh. The flesh, if I were to define flesh, the flesh is the drive that you and I have. The drive that is inside of us that opposes God. It is the drive that you and I have that is constantly opposing God. So hear me. God will speak something to your life. God will say something about your identity. God will affirm you as to who you are. God will begin to speak something about your purpose. About your call. About your future. About your, your money. Your finances. Your career. God begins to speak something into you. But because you've been living by the flesh. Your mind is in the flesh. You start to oppose what God is saying. Ah. So many people, it's not that God didn't speak. It's that the flesh has ruled her now. And everything that is your flesh is opposing God. That's why the Bible says that by the flesh, you reap destruction. If you live by the flesh, you reap death. But if you live by the spirit, you reap what? 
eternal life. So you reap life. So it is through your flesh. That driving force that the enemy needs in your life is through the flesh. He needs disobedience. So there is something in all of us that is opposing God. I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care how much glory you carry. There is something in all of us that is opposing God. And that is called the flesh. Hear me. There is something called the flesh that is opposing God all the time. It opposes what God wants. It opposes what God says. It's opposing the voice of God. It is opposing the ways of God. It is opposing everything that God wants. It is opposing. And the Bible says that those that live by the flesh have their minds on fleshy things. But those that live according to the spirit have their mind on what? Spiritual things. And so all of us have a flesh. Shout, I have a flesh. Say, my flesh is opposing God all the time. All the time. It's not like your flesh is going to get born again. It's not like, apostle, can you deliver me from my flesh? No, you got that thing until the coming of Jesus. And you can thank Adam and you can thank Eve for that. The mind, hear me. So the enemy needs an entrance and how he enters is through your flesh. Because your mind is set on the what? Flesh. Because you walk in the flesh, you're not guided by the spirit of God. You have your mind set on what? The flesh. So what the enemy does is he needs a mind that is on the flesh. Because if the mind is in the flesh, then it becomes the playground for Satan. Every person that walks by the flesh has a mind that became the playground for Satan. Because what Satan does is Satan works on your mind. And the mind that is set on the flesh breeds death. But the Bible says that the mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. The Bible says that the mind that is set in the flesh is hostile to God. It is opposing God. How many thoughts do you have are hostile, that are hostile to God? How many thoughts have you had in the last two months that have been hostile to God? How many things have God, has God spoken to you, but because the mind is the playground for the enemy, all of a sudden now thoughts have come into your mind, and now thoughts are hostile to God. It is opposing what God is saying. And so Satan's primary job is to lie to you. He's a liar from the beginning. He's good at lying. He's crafty. He's an expert at lying. You would think we know his tricks by now. But he's been an expert at lying since the very beginning. Since the beginning of Adam and Eve. So whenever you are listening to a lie, you are listening to a liar. Do you like listening to liars? Do you turn off liars right away? You say, that's a liar right there. Well, it, whenever you listen to a lie, that it is a lie that is hostile to God, you are listening to a liar. You are lending ear to a liar. He's a liar. Shout liar. He's a liar. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that God, this is what God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Say Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. So what does the devil want to do? The devil wants to mislead you. Because when you hear the voice of God, it settles it. But when you hear a lie, a lie that is opposing God, a lie that is hostile to God, a lie that is fighting the voice of God, that lie is there to mislead you. It's trying to lead you in a wrong direction. So hear me, Satan cannot overpower us. Unless we give him permission. Satan does not have authority over us unless we give him permission. So Satan's lies always lead us to a misleading thing. Always. He directs our attention towards perhaps a need or a desire. Watch this. Adam and Eve is in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2, write it down, go home and read it. Verses 16 to 17. And I'll paraphrase it for you or I'll read it for you. It says in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man. 
saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For if in that day you do eat of it, he said, you shall surely die. In other words, Adam and Eve, hear me, they have a perfect life. Everything's perfect. They have each other. Everything's great. They didn't have need of anything. They had everything. They had the glory of God. They had the voice of God. God would speak to them every day. Can you imagine waking up and having conversations in the thick in the morning? Can you imagine having conversations with the Almighty God? Adam had conversations with God. Adam lived in an atmosphere that was glorious. He had need of nothing. Adam and Eve had each other. They had everything. It was perfect. They needed nothing. But hear what I'm going to say to you. Although everything was perfect, they did not have the fruit of one tree. So what does the devil do? The devil points to the one thing that they didn't have. And the devil, what he will do in your life is he will always point to the thing that you don't have. See, the devil's always going to look at something that you don't have. The devil's never going to tell you what you do have. But the devil is going to come to you about what you don't have. And he says, oh, he says, but you can eat of any tree. You, but this one's really good. You want to taste this one. And did it bring satisfaction to Eve? No. It brought death to all of humanity. So he always points to something that you don't have. He's always pointing to something. And it is there. You have to be careful. Because it is there that the voice of God will speak. But so will the voice of the enemy. Because the enemy is always going to turn your attention to that which you don't have. He's not going to tell you, oh, but look how good. Look at your house. You have a car. You have health. You can drive in your car and go to church. He's never going to point out what you do have. But he's always going to point out what you don't have so that you put your attention on that so that you begin to question God so that you begin to do and your own thing and your own flesh and your own ability to go after something that you don't have he went after their desire what did he do Satan came to bring confusion did it satisfy her tell me that church did it satisfy Eve no it brought damnation separation they're now hiding. They cannot hear God. The Lord is speaking, but they're hiding from the voice of God. Because whenever you turn your attention to what you don't have, you have just drowned out the voice of God. That's why great gratitude and thankfulness should never depart your heart. Because when you are grateful every day and you say, God, I thank you. I thank you that I can get up. I thank you, Father, that I have the ability to praise you, to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. Come on, somebody. Give them a praise. I thank you, God, that I have a family. I thank you, God, I have a roof over my head. I thank you, God, that although I don't have the car of my dreams, but I have a car. I thank you, God, that although I'm not where I want to be, but God, thank you, because you pulled me out of that pit. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for tuning in. We pray that these messages we're a blessing to each and to every one of you. And we also pray that you consider partnering with us so that these messages can continue to reach people all across the earth. You will find the link in the description. Thank you so much. Blessings.